Hello, 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 and welcome back to Facts and Figures, uh, episode two. This time is not going to be, it's going to be more about the figure than actually about facts like, like last time. And today we're going to talk about Alves dos Reis, um, the 500 Scrooge scam, probably one of the, the biggest scam or the biggest one in, in the banknote industry. And this is something that it's from my home country, from Portugal, and something that people ask me to talk about. There's a lot of articles about it, but I think uh, with this one you'll get a, also a good view, and maybe you get some other facts that you might not see in other articles online. So I think we have to contextualize first what was happening in, in Portugal at this time. Um, Basically, uh, in the 20s, Portugal had monarchy until 1910. So it was on the 5th of October of 1910 that uh, Portugal became a republic. This was after two years that in between 1908 and 1910, there was the assass first assassination of one king, and then there was this revolution. Um, the days, the initial days of the First Republic, so the 1910s and the beginning of the 20s was a period of high instability in Portugal, a lot of short governments, a lot of coups or various coups, and one short dictatorship of this person that you see here, Sidoni Paes. Uh, in the meantime, there was also the participation of Portugal in the First World War which was more to defend the colonies than actually anything else. Um, so all in all, it's a period of great uncertainty and uh, instability in Portugal, but also some, some progress. Um, the, the Great Depression hadn't yet started, it reached Portugal later. So we're talking about the Alves dos Reis and we're talking about the 1920s. So, in fact, who was this Alves dos Reis? First of all, his name is not Alves dos Reis. Uh, it's Alves Reis only. And uh, he was someone that together with his wife, Maria Luisa, in the beginning of the 1910s, like many other Portuguese, uh, left the continental Portugal and traveled to Angola. He was already uh, a bit ambitious at the time because he traveled to Angola with the forged Oxford electric engineering degree. Uh, so once he arrived in the colony, he quickly got a job um, as director of the Angola Railways, which he did between 1917 and 1918. Here you actually see his appointment. He also earned some money with this job and in 1923 opened uh, a mining business also in Angola. And this is where the first legal problems of Alves Reis started. Uh, it was still in his Angola business in 1924. He uh, basically bought the Angolan railways, but he bought it with checks that didn't have coverage. So the checks bounced back. The aftermath of this first case was that he was sentenced to 50 days in prison in Porto and is those 50 days that actually where he gets the idea of the scam that everyone knows about. So he spent his time in jail actually looking at articles and look and studying um, the Articles of Association of the Bank of Portugal. And he found an interesting, I wouldn't say a loophole, but he found something that was happening at this time. Two interesting things. The first one is that due to the political instability in the country and other factors, the, the Bank of Portugal ordered the printing of banknotes and new money, fresh money, without consulting the government. And uh, in another, another, another interesting fact that is of higher relevance is that all 
the certification equipment um, did not work in the Bank of Portugal since the late 10s, so it was out of order. So both the production as well as the certification of the banknotes was being done abroad. So that's, that's uh, something quite interesting. So it's still in prison that he comes up with this, with the formulation of his plan. And the first thing that he did was to create a contract where he forged signatures. Um, and the contract was, was, was simple. He was, or his mining company in Angola was selling gold to the Angolan government or the colonial government of Angola. One million escudos, not one million escudos, no, one million contos. So that's one billion escudos. Conto is an informal way of saying thousand escudos. Um, so he would sell actually half million contos and in return the the government of Angola gave him a permission, or in this contract, this fictitious contract, gave him a permission to print or order the printing of one million contos and keep some of it to himself and the other the other part he would have to give back to the, the bank, to the um, to the government of the province of Angola. I won't get too much into detail of this colonial setup because uh, this would be a bit too broad for this video. But uh, what, what was clear is that this contract, although forged, was notarized. And more than notarized, uh, the, the contract was also um, acknowledged by both French, English and German institutes in Lisbon. Also an interesting fact here, and you can see the stamps here, the German one here, the, the British one, the French one is one of these, you can see it not so clearly, but this is, this is basically the original contract, which is still in, in archive in the, in the process against him. And for the printing of the banknotes, he actually did attach two banknotes, you can see the one, the 500 here which was the 1,000 escudos from Luis Camões and the 500 escudos from João Deus. We'll see how this plans out together with Waterloo and Sons a bit later. But first, it's important to talk that he didn't do this by himself, of course. He had accomplices. So the first accomplices is, of course, his wife that is fully aware of everything that was going on. And then there was an important man called Karol, Karol Marang. Uh, it's this gentleman here. This was a Dutch businessman that was at the time not very lucky at, at the business that he was doing, but uh, which had a lot of contacts uh, with printers. There was ha Alof Hennis, a German, uh, ex-secret German secret services and re responsible for falsifying uh, British pounds during the First World War for the German government. Uh, there was this couple of guys, it was Antonio Bandeira, which um, was a longtime friend of Alves Reis, and José Bandeira, more important than him, uh, basically the owner consul of Portugal in The Hague, Besides that, then someone that came a bit later was Plano Suarez. He was the ambassador of Venezuela in Lisbon, and he helped when it was needed to carry the the bank or make the banknotes in boxes go uh, through the border. He gave uh, a seal of diplomatic immunity so that no one controls these boxes and the money can get in. So these are the accomplices. So what, how did this fraud actually take place? So you had the contract already, the fake contract. F the first thing that was done by this group was Karl Morang, the Dutch guy, approached a Dutch uh, printing house um, to, to do the banknotes. Uh, I don't know the name of this, this printing house. And he was not lucky there. They rejected this, uh, this printing. 
and then he went to London where he spoke with Waterloo and Sons who accepted the contract. It is told that uh, Lord Waterloo actually sent a letter to the governor of the Bank of Portugal to confirm the contract, but this letter seemed never to have arrived in, in, to the Bank of Portugal or to, to the governor. If this is true or not, it will still be left for history. So the first batch of banknotes printed by, and of course, now it's important to explain why uh, this banknote, this 500, was the one that was printed and not the 500 from João de Deus that you see in the original contract. This was because Waterloo and Sons had only done this banknote for Portugal, none other. And this was the only plate that they had in the company. So basically this was the banknote that was chosen and the only one available. So if history had been different, you might not have the 500 scooch from Vasco da Gama, but the 500 scooch from João de Deus in the scam. So the first batch of these banknotes um, arrived in Portugal in February 2025, or sorry, 1925. And of course, there was a lot of money and how, how would uh, Alves dos Reis do it to pump this money into the economy? So he used the different, different methods. The first one was to recruit small um, entrepreneurs, small agents, small shops that would just bring these fresh banknotes to um, exchange, foreign exchange bureaus and exchange it for foreign currency. And there was also a lot of money that he deposited in different bank accounts of basically all the banks available in Portugal at the time. But this was not enough. So after he had done all of this, he began spending a lot of money. And this was very visible in, this, in society, especially in the north of Portugal, which was a smaller society than this is today. He bought a big palace here, this one in, in Lisbon, which is now the British Council, actually. Um, and he actually started his own bank called Bank of Angola and Metropoli. Metropoli, it's also the name of, of that was given to continental Portugal, so the Metropoli. Um, with this purchases and all of this, the quickly the initial amount of money ran out so he ordered uh, already in june july the same year another order for 280,000 scouts or 280,000 contos to be printed to waterloo this 280,000 will never actually reach circulation but it was printed and i'll tell you more about it a bit later so i think it's important to understand how much was actually 500 scouts back in the day um, so first of all, the amount printed uh, between the two orders, between the first and the second order to Waterloo, was something that would be worth nowadays around two billion U.S. dollars, and that was, uh, according to reports at the time, one sixth of all the money circulating. So, at the height of this, um, of 1925 around one sixth of all the banknotes circulating in portugal or at least of the value of the banknotes circulating in portugal were these forgeries but the one banknote of 500 scudos was a lot of money so in relative terms if you take the exchange rates at the time you would see that uh, 500 scudos would be 25 dollars and a half or five pounds, 14 shillings, um, or close to that. In today's money, just according to inflation, one of these banknotes would be the same as having a 367 euro bank, uh, US dollar banknote, or a 349 pound banknote. So it was a lot of money. 
some reports at the time, the ones that I could find from newspapers tell you what you could buy with 500 scudos at the time. So for example, if you wanted to furnish your entire house, not with Ikea um, things, but with the uh, proper, I would say proper, but with the um, custom made furniture, basically for the whole house of uh, three bedrooms, etc., it would cost you 24 of these 500 Scrooge banknotes. But a heater, and I'm not sure if this heater works, but this, this type of heater at the time would cost basically one third of one of these, these banknotes. And for example, this toy bed for babies, or actually the, the, the text here says one of these baby dolls would cost, well, 500 euros. You could buy 200 baby dolls or around 30-ish beds for the baby doll. So of course, I don't know. And of course the newspapers will not tell you how much was a was a liter of milk, etc. But I think you get the idea that this was actually a lot of money for the time, just one of these banknotes. So imagine all this, this amount. So how did he get caught or how, how does, how did this unfold in the end? So this was actually very quick. It was from February until December, December, basically it's the end of this, this Alves Reich case, at, le at least the, the portion that uh, where people would participate, where everyone would know about it. But the first thing is that it was noted that someone uh, that was unknown in the, the Portuguese society was very rich and also there were or uh, began to be a very rich person in, in just a few months and together he was also uh, creating some other smaller, richer uh, entrepreneurs which were the agents that would change the money, etc. So there was a lot of money running around, especially in the north of Portugal. So this caught the attention of a newspaper called SECU. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but uh, it ran all the way to 1977. It's uh, quite a well-known um, newspaper, and at the time uh, it defended mostly the economical interests of another bank and another economical group that is not important for for this analysis. So the first thing that came up was that Adolf Henning, the guy, uh, the German forger, he made the news internationally still in this year for being involved in a fraudulent scheme or lending two million US dollars to Albania. So that was the first point. So there was they knew that there was a connection there. But also Newspaper articles started com coming up on who was Alves dos Reis and also about his past in Angola, that he was arrested, etc. And this not being enough, people also started doubting where all this $500, 500 Scudos bills were coming from. So one of these exchange bureaus in Porto, one of the officers there basically wrote a report to a bank called Bank Spirit Sant, which was actually doesn't exist now for a few years because of another uh, one of the, the biggest economical scandal in Portugal ever. But that's not important for now. But uh, basically, they they this clerk sent a report to to this bank, stating that they should look into the the authenticity of this banknotes. The bank then wrote to the Bank of Portugal, who started an investigation. Uh, so while Alves dos Reis was in, in Angola on business, this was in, in November 2020, uh, 1925, uh, Bank of Portugal started doing a, a forensic investigation on this banknote. So they collected a lot of these banknotes that were in Porto, in this exchange bureau, and later also in in the Angolan Metropolis Bank and looked at these banknotes and initially found that there was nothing wrong with them. They seemed authentic. Mm, it was only when one of the experts took some of these banknotes to Lisbon and where the, the 
where the headquarters of the Bank of Portugal is and started comparing with the banknotes that they had on hand there that they discovered one duplicate. So basically two banknotes with the same serial number. And this was the end because after that they found other duplicates and more and more and things <laughs> quickly escalated. So Blanes Suarez, as you remember, the guy from Venezuela also, or seeing how this was being was unfolding, contacted the police saying that he had a few boxes of bills of banknotes in, in his office uh, from Alves dos Reis that he didn't know anything about. And uh, that's the, the, the photo that you have here of his office. And, and it, it was done. So Alves dos Reis is actually arrested when he comes in early December from Angola back um, together with uh, most of his accomplices, at least the ones that were in Portugal. Uh, the Bank of Portugal orders all these 500 Scrooge banknotes to be recalled on the 6th of December of 1925. And uh, basically the trial lasted until 1930, so five years, which is not a lot for Portugal, I have to, to admit. Um, the trial initially was very impactful, so there was, this was news everywhere, of course, and Alves dos Reis initially just blamed, he, he said, okay, he never rejected the claims that he was part of, of this scam, but he, at the beginning, he told that this was with the convenience of polit both politicians as well as the governor of the Bank of Portugal, which was not true in the end nevertheless led to uh, police riding uh, the, or actually arresting for a few hours the governor of Portugal and the, the vice governor only to release them afterwards and also for the parliament to lift immunity of all the deputies and nothing was found. It was only when the police arrested uh, his wife that he actually confessed and saying that was, this was all he's doing but this is an important part because damage was done to society in Portugal with his initial words. So I said the trial lasted until 1930. It basically after 1926, it fell a bit into into processual uh, nightmare and it was slow and it was not news anymore. And in the end, Alves dos Reis, uh, Zé Bandeira and Adolf uh, Henning all got 20 years jail sentence. Henning was uh, absent, so he, he did not, uh, he, he was never arrested. Uh, the Dutch businessman Karel got 11 months that he did in The Hague. Antonio Bandeira got six months and the wife of Alves Reis uh, got time served. Blanes Suarez, despite his efforts um, of trying to get rid of the banknotes that were in his office, uh, had to end his diplomatic career and return to Venezuela, never to be heard about again. So what was the impact of all, all this case and everything around here? That it was much more than just a case, a police case. In the end, this was almost defining for for Portugal. As I told in the beginning, uh, Portugal was living through a complicated time and this case brought further distrust in politicians and also in the Bank of Portugal. And the year after, in May 1926, uh, there is uh, one last coup, this time done by the right wing military and this last coup basically lasted 48 years this was the longest or well, the coup led to the second republic which is called Estado Novo and this led to the dictatorship of Salazar which lasted 48 years although he was he died after 44 of these years but this dictatorship lasted for 48 years being the largest one in in Europe continuous so that was the effect on Portugal in terms of, of politics, so damaging effect 
Waterloo and Sons. Well, Portugal did sue Waterloo and Sons in the London courts, and after a few years of back and forth in 1932, the the British courts uh, awarded Portugal or told Waterloo and Sons to pay Portugal an indemnization of 621,000 pounds. This is worth around around 44 million pounds today. And this was basically almost an end to Waterloo and Sons. They, they still existed for more years, for close to another 30 years, uh, but they never really recovered from this blow. And they were bought in the 60s by Delarue. Alves dos Reis, or Alves Reis, he, uh, he spent his 20 years in prison. Uh, he was released. He wrote two books that were bestsellers in prison, basically explaining his fraud. And he died uh, and lived the rest of a normal life. The only thing that remained untold, and this is still a mystery that nobody was able to find a solution for, is that besides the duplicates, there were also triplicates of certain banknotes. And nobody knows what happened there. Who ordered these triplicate banknotes? It was not Alves Reis that was proven. So nobody knows and, well, Nobody seems to, to be interested anymore in this mystery. I think that's all I covered uh, this history. I didn't cover the banknote by itself. I covered more the man and the story. Uh, but let me know if you want to know more about, about the banknote specifically. And thanks you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.